hello, I'm Tim Teal. Um, I work at Martin Guitar. I've been here for close to 37 years at this point. Um, my role in the company is to design and facilitate new instruments. Um, I've held many different roles over the years. Uh, I do enjoy this one quite a bit. And um, yeah, we were talking a little bit about uh, cornerstones and the foundation of the company. And one thing we are known for is the X-Brace. So how did that evolve? Well, C.F. Martin, when he started off, um, he moved from Germany to New York, and he took with him the expertise he gained in Germany from Johann Stauffer. So he learned to build a very good quality guitar, and that guitar um, was a small body, nylon string guitar, and over time, uh, he was influenced, C.F. Uh, Senior was influenced by the Spanish style guitar. And that Spanish style guitar had a different headstock on it. So the headstock of the Stauffer is more of a uh, kind of curvy, you know, it looks almost like a different brand <laughs> that you would see in, in modern days. But that um, evolution from a Stauffer style to a Spanish style really set the foundation um, for the next leg of Martin's history. And that is from going from the normal fan braced nylon string guitar to an X brace. And the first X brace that we ever uh, have known of, and we have a, um, an example of it here in the museum, is a guitar built for a woman. Her name was Madame Dagoni. She was a, a very prominent performer in the uh, mid-1800s. And so she visited the Martin family here in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And she basically um, spent a little bit of time in this area, probably a few months. And CF Sr. built her this guitar and he designed the X-Brace. And the X-Brace proved to be uh, something that was very strong and it could uh, withstand the rigors of all the traveling that they would do um, from here to New York and throughout the country. She um, kept that guitar in great shape. We have it here in the museum, which is really, really cool. But that was the first uh, major step into the next phase of a guitar from going from nylon string to steel string. And back in the 1920s and 30s, performers were looking to get a louder instrument. There was a little amplification. So they were playing in, in bands and small, small uh, halls that you would need uh, to either overcome the other instruments that were with you if you were in a, a bigger band. And so the steel string actually allowed them to get a bigger sound to the audience. So along that same time, uh, the size of the guitar started evolving. And really, in recent times, we rediscovered a guitar that uh, they're calling it the missing link between the small body guitars that Martin was making in the 1800s to the bigger dreadnought that we all know and love today. And this guitar is, um, was commissioned by a major Kialakai in Hawaii. He was the band leader for the uh, Royal Hawaiian Band. And he basically wanted this larger body, um, w what you would think of as maybe a, a, a four-aught style, but even, even a little bit bigger. Um, the only remnants of that is a wooden form that we have in our archive room. And we were able to take that wooden form and translate some of the older f photos that we had. And we came up with this really um, inspirational, yet kind of harkens back to that uh, original guitar for the major Kialakai. Um, that allowed him to play louder and because he was in a big band setting. That then led into the Ditson um, guitars. So Ditson wanted a big guitar as well. And really the size of these two guitars are very similar in their length, but the shape is very different. So the shape of the Dreadnought is more boxy, whereas the uh, Major's uh, Kialakai model was a little more shapely, uh, more like an hourglass. 
they both have beautiful tone. And um, as you know, the, the D12 fret from uh, the Ditson was then um, moved into uh, the D28. So the very first D28 was in like 1931. And uh, that was a 12-fret model. Along comes this other gentleman, Perry Bechtel. And Perry Bechtel was a banjo player. A banjo player, you know, he's used to going all the way up, long, long access to different frets. And he says to Martin, hey, I want a guitar that joins the body at the 14th fret. And of course, at the time, no, we can't do that. Eventually, he, he was persistent enough, and the company did build him an orchestra model joined at the 14th fret. Well, now you have your 14 fret models. That translated to the Dreadnought as well. So today, the Dreadnought 14 fret, the Dreadnought 12 fret, two very iconic models, along with the OM. Now we're in the 1930s. Um, the 1930s into the 40s, that was considered the golden era of guitar building at Martin. And it's something that we go back to even today as we replicate these models with our authentic series. And I, I do have the privilege of working very closely on the development of those guitars. And we've been doing it now for probably 10 or 15 years. Every time we go back and revisit a model, you're always learning something new. Um, for instance, in 1933, there was a logo that was specifically used for that model. In 1934, it changed, and we don't know why, but we replicated that 1933 logo. Um, eventually, we're going to replicate uh, its transition from 1934. We found that they're pretty consistent all the way up to 1966. So it is very interesting to see how these guitars evolved over time. After the 1930s and the 40s, you went through the war. Um, materials were rationed. You know, um, people talk a lot about T, T bars versus ebony bars, and we're talking uh, truss rod reinforcement. So uh, the, the T-bar on the truss rod reinforcement was there to stabilize the neck. And again, we have steel strings, so we have things moving and twisting more than we would on a, on a nylon string guitar. Um, some people love the sound or the playability of those that have T-bars. Some like the lightness of the guitar with the ebony bar. And, um, you know, it's just really interesting to see how um, the guitar ha has evolved. We, we didn't get in, involved in, uh, to the adjustable rods, which is another milestone, until about the 1980s. So if you think about it, we had non-adjustable rods from the company's start in 1833 all the way up to about the 1980s. And the first uh, adjustable rod we had was a single action rod, meaning that as the neck would bow, you could tighten up that rod and you could bring the neck back so it was straighter or flatter. In the 1990s, closer to the 2000s mark, we started investigating two-way adjustable truss rods. So it's like, you know, once we started that evolution, we started looking at uh, different types of adjustments and, and rod types about every 10 years. Uh, in more recent times with the modern deluxe, we've also experimented with, it's a two-way rod, but it's also developed to be lighter and uh, stronger uh, being made of titanium. So even though it's a very similar design as, as it was you know, even back to the 1930s, we're always taking a look at what is new and what we can uh, take from the modern and put to the traditional side. Uh, so the, the modern deluxe is a great example of, of that in general. Um, we're using bracing, we're using layout and construction that are very similar to some of the older um, authentic style guitars, but with the titanium truss rod, with the carbon fiber composite bridge plate, with the liquid metal uh, bridge pins, uh, it, 
it's something that only our forefathers could have imagined when they were designing these guitars. The very beginning of our process is buying lumber or sets of wood. And today, uh, we prefer to buy sets of wood primarily for back and sides and tops or soundboards. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, at the mill, they will have gone through and selected uh, woods that meet our standards. And uh, we don't have a, a large sawmill here, here as we did you know, back in the 1970s. So we prefer to buy sets if possible. Um, we do also buy lumber, uh, dimensional lumber for necks and bigger block stock. Um, and, and that's due to the fact that we like to billet out each neck and try to get the yield of the wood um, as much as possible through that lumber. So once the wood comes in, it's inspected. Uh, if it meets the initial inspection, it'll either be uh, stickered if it meets um, moisture content um, specifications, if not, It'll either go into a, uh, a drying kiln for a little bit. Sometimes we get wood in that's a little too dry, so we'll put it into a wet room and just you know, let it rehydrate a little bit. Uh, once it goes through that process, it can take a couple months to even get to that point. Then it will eventually make its way into the acclimation room. It's a place where we maintain the exact conditions that the wood will see as it goes through manufacturing. While it's in there, it's just settling and um, it's a, uh, allowed to have a lot of air movement around uh, each part, so it's on little sticks. And those little sticks um, keep that airflow real nice and even so things don't tend to warp. It may sit in there for a few months up to a few years depending on what it is and what our needs are. We do have a, a strategic wood initiative. So we take a look at the woods that we have in stock on a monthly basis. We look at opportunities to buy um, woods that may be available and how they could be utilized in the next um, anywhere from five to 10 years. So it's that long of a process. Um, once the wood is ready for prime time for the production, um, it then starts making its way out of the acclimation room and it starts getting put into the different areas to make the components, either sides, backs, tops. Um, could go to the, the CNC milling area for, for necks or fingerboards or bridges, that sort of thing. Uh, we are really uh, conscious of how critical it is to have things properly set, dried, and um, acclimated. It brings, brings back a story. I, I remember hearing um, Chris's grandfather, C.F. III, talk about this in a, uh, a, a public talk that he did at, at one of the local colleges. And he was talking about seasoning the wood and how they used to do it over at the old factory. So all the way up in the attic, if you, if you went up there, um, they would have sections that they would set aside, that when their wood supply came in, they would, they would do what they had to do, but eventually it would make its way up into the rafters. And the, that part of the uh, building was not conditioned at all. So it would see all the heat, it would see all the cold, it would see all the humidity, it would see all the dryness. And after 10 or 15 years being up there under those changing conditions, if that piece of wood survived, you knew it was gonna make a great guitar because it went through a lifetime of uh, changes, right? So today, um, you know, we, we do our best through modern technology to simulate uh, some of that uh, seasoning, as you call it, and try to get the wood at a, at a proper level so that when it does leave the factory and it goes to different parts of the world, it's um, as stable as it can be. Uh, speaking of seasoning and, and stability and stuff, we, we developed our own torfaction um, system. We call it VTS, Vintage Tone System. And we've 
worked with a, a, a wood treater who treats wood, um, and we had them replicate the level you would see of a guitar that was 80 to 100 years old um, through their process so that this wood has been uh, gone through a accelerated aging process. Now the wood, uh, when you tap it, it chimes like the old wood. And when you play the guitar, it sounds just like you would hear one of these guitars in the museum. Um, it, is, it is pretty phenomenal. Uh, that VTS uh, is actually being used on the Modern Deluxe and on our Authentic line. Of course, if you desired a custom, you could also order, order that VTS on your custom as well. A Martin guitar, in its essence, is a quality instrument that is an heirloom for the rest of your life. Um, and I think that's the basis of why people gravitate to the brand because they know it's an investment. It's not just a commodity. It's not a, well, let me try this guitar. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll like it, maybe I won't. They invest time of their own to investigate which guitar speaks to them. They, they know that the brand has been around since 1833, so they know um, the quality level is there. And certainly, it's been a, an iconic guitar over time. So you've seen and heard all of these uh, wonderful instruments being played throughout history. And so it's very easy for consumers uh, of, of fine musical instruments to connect their passion as a guitar player to our brand. And um, working here as long as I have, I can, I can attest to all of the quality measures that are in place to provide the highest quality instrument uh, within its price range. And I think everybody, all of, all of the other companies out there making acoustic guitars, um, they certainly benchmark off of us you know, for sound quality, our playability, our longevity. And it is interesting that, um, as we, we spoke about before, the 1930s and 40s, that is considered by all the experts uh, to be the golden era of guitar making that Martin started. So Martin was the first. Today we see other brands trying to um, capitalize on that. Uh, the only problem is they weren't there. You know, they didn't, they didn't start making guitars you know, up until a few years ago, uh, relatively speaking. So um, I think when you add everything up, um, it's hard to argue that um, you know, why wouldn't I buy a Martin? You know, and I think uh, most of the people I know either have at least one Martin or several, right, along with some other instruments, because as guitar players, as musicians, we are passionate about um, what we do, what we play, and um, you want something that you can eventually hand down to the next generation. As a young boy, uh, my experience the first Martin I ever played was my grandfather's uh, guitar. It was a, uh, a D35. Um, he started here in 1966, and he was allowed to make what they would call an employee model. So uh, you had to work here at least one year. And in 1968, his D35 made out of Brazilian rosewood and a German spruce top was completed. Um, so I was born around the time he started, and by the time I was old enough to understand uh, what I was looking at and listening to, um, that always sunk in my brain, and my grandfather always told me, there is nothing that sounds better than a Martin guitar. And it was the first guitar I learned to play. You know, he put it in my hands when I was about 10 years old. We started you know, just trying to, trying to get some, um, you know, chops put together. And um, to this day, me personally, when I, when I hear a D35 being played, my mind instantly goes back to that earlier time. And I think that's so true with many people. Um, whether you start with Martin, like I did, or you discover Martin later in life, 
Um, you know, I, I know personal friends who, who started with other guitar brands for one reason or another. And uh, eventually we got to know each other and, you know, they got introduced to the brand. And uh, sure enough, they've all bought and, you know, it's, it's, it's their favorite instrument because when they pick it up and play it, you get this, you get this great sound out of the guitar. It, it inspires you to create and enjoy um, the music within you or trying to replicate other music that you've heard over the years. Uh, so it's a great experience. People have really enjoyed it. I know uh, people who have played since they're, you know, in their early teens, and I know some people who just started playing in their 50s. And it's, it's amazing to watch um, the discovery process as they go through, and well, what does this model do, and why is, why is there so many different guitars? Because each guitar has its own voice and can be used so differently with different instruments, or with different songs and different genres. Mm -hmm. 